Book 4, Falcon in the Barn, Chapter 37 Who in the world would be brave enough to visit us? Instead of going through her back door as she normally did, Mari went to her front garden to inspect her seeds before entering the house. It had been three weeks since she planted, and she was hoping something would decide to bravely break through the gravelly soil, but it was too dark for her to see anything. Or maybe Pedro had been right. Nothing would know how to grow there. Disappointed, but not yet discouraged, she trudged through the front door, went straight to the sofa, and plopped onto it. She had thought expecting a baby was the hardest thing to do, but watching her daughter expecting was a very close second. Noticing that the kitchen door had swung shut as she came in, Perrin was likely trying to figure out something for dinner, she called out to him. So it wasn't the real thing, as I'm sure you've surmised by now. Pato snored loudly in his bedroom. I knew it was far too early, she called again. It's better this way, but Jatesy won't believe that tonight. Her husband said something quietly in the kitchen. Perrin, are you all right in there? Uh, yes, he called louder. Fine. Want some help? No, 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 I've got it. Really, I'm not that tired. She lied as she closed her eyes and heard the door to the kitchen slowly open. Since when do you come home through the front door? He asked. Since I have a garden to attend to. Nothing's up in it yet, as far as I can tell. Uh, dinner will be ready in a while. Got a late start, just baking some potatoes. We've got cheese, too. Pedro made it, so we should be cautious. Sounds fine, she mumbled with her eyes still closed. Noticing only vaguely the way that he said cheese suggested additional meanings. But cautious about cheese? A moment later, his voice was right above her. Mari, we need to talk. She forced her eyes open to look at him, hearing something tight and tense in his voice. In the dim candlelight, she noticed apprehension in his face that she had never seen before. Maybe he wasn't only worried about Pato's cheese. Immediately, she sat up straighter. What's wrong? He gave her the dinner smile. Nothing's wrong, exactly. It's just that... Uh, his eyes flickered to the front door, then back to her again. You came through that door. Despite her questioning expression, he continued, Mari, when I came home tonight, I found a visitor waiting for me. Mari blinked at him, stunned that someone had been there. Who in the world would be brave enough to visit us? Interesting choice of words for your question, he chuckled rigidly. Who in the world? I haven't yet heard everything, but we need to hear this together. Mari, it seems that perhaps a solution has found us. With his eyes, he gestured to the kitchen. Her shoulders sagged in disappointment. But Perrin, tear up land. What happened to your plan? We were going... She stopped as a horrible realization came to her. Maybe the visitor in the kitchen wasn't someone who would let them leave. Perhaps it was someone from the garrison or the administrators. And here she was, blurting out their secrets, very incautiously. Mari, will you listen to what the visitor has to say? She'd never seen him so hesitant and stiff. Maybe this was finally Idemia's response to her outburst. Feeling herself grow weak, she said, Perrin, are you sure? Mari, just... He glanced to the kitchen. Just wait here. She sat up properly and turned from her position on the sofa to watch him go to the kitchen, bracing herself for whatever would come through that door. She had to be brave. There was no other choice. A moment later, someone came through the door, initially hard to see in the dim candlelight. But soon Mari noticed enough that she stiffened and took to her feet. Perrin walked calmly behind the stranger who wore rough linen or cotton, Mari wasn't sure, dyed in mottled colors. She went into full alarm. Perrin, 
Why is there a garter in my house? Actually, we're not always called garters, the person, female, said as she padded, strangely tranquil, across the room. Mari glared at Perrin. His face was unreadable, which made Mari feel even more anxious. A woman? A garter woman, which Perrin thought didn't exist, but that Mari knew did. She recognized the clothing, the same as she had seen on the woman years ago in the forest. But this wasn't the same person. She was younger, darker, and more gentle. Gentle? Her soft brown eyes complemented her curly soft black hair, which was tied up in a wide ponytail. Everything about the woman was calm, reassuring, and highly suspicious. She stopped in front of Mari. Our ancestors were sort of garters for a time, but now we have taken a new name, Salemites. Every inch of Mari panicked. What does that mean? She looked frantically to Perrin for answers, who stood behind the woman. Mari fully expected to see him holding his long knife, prepared to eliminate the threat in their gathering room, but his hands were empty. Just listen, Mari and keep an open mind. He smiled tentatively. If anyone can, it's you. He pulled out a chair by the table and sat down, nodding for the woman to continue. Mari knew her mouth was hanging wide open, but she had no power to close it. She stared at her husband, then finally back at the woman. The visitor smiled so beautifully Mari felt her whole body become warm. That was wrong. She hated this woman and her people who killed her husband's parents, who took Perrin away from her for so many times, who, who... I understand you know the history of your people very well, Mari Shin, she said kindly. Tell me, what happened to the men who were guarding the Ninth Guide? Mari scoffed. Ugh! They killed Pax and 200. They had spies everywhere. And when Quirrell the first discovered the traitors, he rooted them out. We've been rooting garters out ever since. Astonishingly, Perrin slowly shook his head. Mari's shoulders fell. What, Perrin? The woman kneeled down in front of Mari. The action was so unexpected that Mari quit spluttering and sat down clumsily on the sofa to see what odd thing the woman would do next. Mari Shen, Guide Pax, wasn't killed. The men guarding him were not traitors. They were his assistants, his brothers, and his protectors. So what happened to him? Mari snapped. Tell me that. I would love to, she said with a radiant smile. It was King Quarrel and Guide Pax who had disagreements. It was King Quarrel's guards who were told to kill Pax. And it was those guards who betrayed Quarrel, not the other way around. The guards supported the guide and told Pax that Quarrel wanted him and all other followers of the writings dead. King Quarrel feared that the followers would destroy his kingdom and power by protesting his changes to the world. Pax recognized much could be resolved in letting Quirrell believe he was successful. So Pax and the guards went into the forest toward Mount Deceit, just as Quirrell wanted. They found a route past Moorland to a new land. The guards then left Pax and a few of his men, returned to Moorland, killed a deer in the forest, bloodied their cloaks and hands, and allowed themselves to be captured. Mari sat breathless, unable to believe what she was hearing, yet desperately hoping it was true. Quirrell told the world he executed the guards for their treachery, but in reality, he rewarded them for eliminating his greatest enemy. A few nights later, he released the seven guards to escape from Idemia, their pockets filled with reward gold. They split up went to different villages of the world, bringing word to others who were devoted to Pax that they had found a new home. They went to every village bringing the good news, along with directions of how to get there, 
and even a bit of gold to help them leave. Quarrel's reward gold became the means for moving more than 2,000 men, women, and children. Mari couldn't move. She was too stunned to even blink. All of the history she had known so well was just Quarrel's story. His story. After a few hundred people disappeared, Quirrell became suspicious. But after two weeks and more than 2,000 people missing, he began to realize something was quite wrong. That's when he fabricated the story about garters, about a people living in a secret society out to betray and destroy the world. The light in the woman's face dimmed and her voice quieted. We lost almost 400 people who tried to join our ancestors. They were tracked down and killed by Quarrel soldiers. After that, we had to establish secret ways to move them. Her face brightened considerably. And we did. We've been successful ever since. The division of the world did happen, Mari Shin, and it's still happening. The words, as soft and sweetly as the woman delivered them, hit Mari with the force of an ice storm. Yet still she was filled with enormous heat and tears flooded her eyes. So conflicted and surprised, she didn't know what to think. It was too much to believe. It was too good to be true. She looked at Perrin. He was leaning forward in his chair, arms resting on his legs, watching her intently. In a way, Pax was an explorer. The dark woman smiled at Perrin's explanation. We're not as you've been told. Your kings and now administrators ignore all evidence of us. To keep your people here, they had to control you with fear of the unknown. Just like a parent tells of dangers of wild beasts to keep a child within arm's reach. And it worked very well she said with a sad smile. The children of the governments have never questioned their leaders. Even when they were mature enough to realize the truth could be something entirely different. A memory buried deep in the back of Mari's mind suddenly flared up, filling her again with such heat and light it nearly knocked her off the sofa. She gulped as the woman smiled at her. Mrs. Shin, a long time ago, you were told that some day would come for you. Do you remember that night? Oh, yes. All of it rushed back to her. Memories that she tried to forget. The forest. The woman. Almost 16 years ago, she watched her husband riding along the forest's edge, trying to discern what was disturbing the woods. That night, she decided she would discover the truth about the garters. She ran into the forest, was surprised by a woman, was too cowardly to find the truth. Perrin stared at her, mystified, with his eyebrows furrowed. The woman in front of Mari seemed to read it all on her face. Do these words sound familiar to you, Mrs. Shin? There will be a day when you will be ready to leave it all behind and embrace the truth. Until then, think of this night never again. Should your mind ever find itself surprised by this memory, tell yourself it was just a vivid dream, for that's all it really is. You can practice looking at the world in different ways, preparing your mind to realize you know really nothing at all. Looking at the sky and realizing it changes minute by second. But until that someday comes, nothing will ever quite make sense. That's all right. But when that day does come, everything will hit you with such finality and power, you will never again be able to forget it or deny it. You will find the truth and run to it. Dear Creator, was all Mari could whisper, as the words she'd forced herself to forget reformed themselves clearly in her mind. She'd almost forgotten that a day would come for her. And now? Mari gasped. Oh, she was one of you. Mari, Perrin asked sharply, what's this all about? How could she tell him about the time she was a naive 31-year-old 
who thought her husband and father-in-law were cowards, that she ran straight into a garter and shrank away from the truth, that she found their massive black dog Barker bounding through the forest, most likely acting as a distraction that had frustrated her husband in the fort all day long. The kneeling woman somehow knew it all. It means, Mr. Shin, that your wife is ready to hear the truth, and whatever it is, and wherever it is, she'll accept it. I will, Mari breathed, but this is all so unbelievable. Tell me a truth, Perrin demanded, his squint becoming cynical. Gladly. So well have your administrators poisoned your minds against us that rarely has anyone set foot on your mountains beyond your forest. We know. We watch. We always have. We were always ready to welcome your people. But the lies were so readily accepted that no truth could enter your imagination. She leaned closer to Murray. We're a simple people who have a beautiful life. We're not violent. We don't raid your lands, and we never have. She turned to Perrin before she dropped the next sentence. Your own people do that. Possible, he conceded. We've suspected for years that garters were living among us. Riplak, Cumin, maybe even old wiles. But I imagine it's more widespread than I had suspected. The woman nodded grimly. It is. The garters have always been a secret group, but secret among your own citizens. An army needs an enemy, correct? The kings knew it, and so do the administrators. If you don't have an enemy to fight, you begin to fight among yourselves. I believe you've seen that in the past year, ever since you eliminated the garters in Moorland. Perrin let out a low whistle. Oh, yes, yes we have with the land grab. You say the administrators know. Who? How many? Unsure, she shook her head. If we knew, we could have much more success in exposing them. But we suspect at the very top, it's a very small number. Maybe just a couple. Maybe just Nico Mal, Perrin said darkly. The woman shrugged. None of our people have been able to get close enough to him to know, but that's what we believe. Perrin nodded, his jaw working in thought. But, Mari said, trying to organize the onslaught of information that was overwhelming her, you said you watch us from the forests. Yes, we have for years, she smiled again. And not just from the forests. We live among you, too. We've always sent scouts. Some spend just a few seasons, some a few years. We watch and help as we can. Who do you send? Mari asked, still in disbelief. The woman beamed. You met one just recently. Mrs. Brax Hicks, the midwife? She came to your daughter a few weeks ago. She, what, yeah, uh, Mari remembered. Mrs. Braxix knew how to check the color of the sky. We have a midwife in every village, and even in Idamea now, the woman explained. We started over 20 years ago. Some of our midwives have gotten themselves in trouble by being too vocal, but we've never lost one yet. We're trying now to undo the administrator's damage. Mrs. Braxix is hoping to convince them to make some changes in their new handbook. We have much better ways. And I don't know if you've noticed, there are very few of your women who want to be midwives. Your people have so few babies now. I liked her, Mari considered. She seemed to know what she was doing. She does. She has 12 children herself. 12, Mari gasped. And she's delivered hundreds more. Edge needs someone like her. Your daughter needs her. That's why she's here. Before Mari could question how the woman knew about their daughter, Perrin fidgeted. Who else has Salem supplied? Mari heard the growing paranoia in his voice. She was feeling a bit paranoid herself. 
Idemia and the world no longer have much use for midwives, and they also have little use for rectors, she told him. So, for the past few years, all rectors have come from Salem as well. Perrin sat up with a small yet irritated smile. Did you have a little old rector? He snapped his fingers, trying to remember the name. The woman laughed lightly. Are you thinking of the one who several seasons ago caused a little disturbance in the traffic of Edge before your attack on Moreland? Rector Chaim? Yes, Perrin slapped his leg. He's yours? She nodded. And he was mortified by it. When he returned, he told us all about it and how it was worth it all because he got to meet you. He's still quite remorseful. Perhaps you could let him know that you've forgiven him? Perrin nodded, the tension in his face easing briefly. He said he had known about me for years. I couldn't figure out what that meant. We have known about you for years. We've watched you from the forests. So is Rector Young? Mari began. She nodded again. One of us as well, yes. He returned to us with several other rectors right after Mr. Shin resigned, and the administrator said that they were no longer needed. Unbelievable, Perrin whispered. And Mrs. Shin, that night I just spoke of, the woman said gently. The woman you met in the forest was his wife. Mari covered her mouth with her hand, but Perrin jerked in surprise. Mari, you? In the forest? That was Mrs. Young? Mari asked the woman, unable to face her husband just yet. She was, she was one of our best scouts, especially in the trees, the woman explained. She passed away peacefully some years ago in her sleep. But that night, many years ago, she wrote down the words she spoke to you so that we could tell them to you when the time was right. Perrin held his hands out, his patience gone. Mari? She gulped. His expression was dreadful. I'll tell you later, I promise. She turned back to their visitor, who strangely seemed safer for the moment. Why are you all here? To bring home those who should be with us to Salem, the woman explained. There are many in the world who feel disaffected by it. It no longer reflects their beliefs or hopes. They're alone and lost and looking for something more. The Creator plants in all of us a seed of hope. Some people let it die. Some deliberately crush it. Some let others destroy it. But there are those who protect it and help it grow. They know something more is out there and they look for it. Does this sound familiar to you? It was so familiar, it was as if she were reading their minds. Perrin cleared his throat roughly, forgetting for the moment about his wife's unexplained visit to the forest. Yes, his voice cracked. Mari nodded, tears trickling down her face, which she brushed away. She thought of Guide Hiram again, pleading with the first families to not reject the society the Creator had established for them. So often she had read his last words, uttered just before he was killed by the six men who formed Idemia, that she could hear them in her head again. But instead of feeling sorrow for a lost way of living, she felt... We have what you're looking for in Salem, the woman promised. We follow the writings. We allow people to think, to grow, and to explore. We even allow them to disagree and debate. But mostly we are of one mind and one heart. We live after the way the Creator established for the first 500 families. We even teach our children to notice the true color of the sky. Mari knew what she was feeling. Hope. For the first time in weeks, years, hope. Everyone has a place there. Perrin Shin, Mari Shin, 
there is room for you as well and for your children. It would be so convenient to believe you, Perrin said, his voice still shaky, but also so difficult. This could be an elaborate hoax. I gullibly surrender to you, and then what? I get turned over to the garters, who you still may very well be. Perhaps they've sent you here to take me, so they can have revenge for what I did to Moreland. He certainly looks like one of them. He? He who? Mari looked around quickly. A large, dark man emerged from a shadow next to the front door. Mari whimpered. Please don't be alarmed, he said in a deep voice. I walked right past you. Yes, you did, he chuckled softly. That's why she'd never make a good officer, Perrin said dully. She misses things. Mari saw Perrin's long knife in the man's hand, his arms crossed. He unfolded them. Would it make it easier to believe me if I were no longer holding this? He held up the knife. Until he passed in front of her on his way to the table, Mari didn't realize how massive the man was. He seemed to blend into the shadows, making him appear to be part of everything and everywhere. She tried to stifle another whimper. The man stopped and looked at her kindly. His dark face was far more pleasant than she expected. You don't need to fear me. If I really wanted to kill you, I could have done it a while ago. Besides, I never kill anyone unless I have to. I usually try only to give people something to remember me by. He turned to Perrin. I always thought that was excellent advice. He noiselessly pulled out the drawer next to Perrin, whose mouth was hanging open. The man placed the knife in and closed the drawer. Perrin... Mari whispered. How did he know where? The man turned so that he could look at both of them. You're right. I do look like a garter. That's because garters try to look like us. They've copied our dress, our mannerisms, even our ability to negotiate the forest. Not as successfully, though, he said with a satisfied smile. They have no originality or creativity. They steal everything from your goods and security to our techniques. There have always been two groups in the forest, Colonel, but you never saw us. You saw garters, but not Salemites. Well, except for one more. Perrin let out a low breath, his shoulders sagging. Something to remember me by, he whispered, shaking his head. I'm so dense. He turned his gaze from the man and looked at Mari. He raised one eyebrow at her and twitched his nose. Mari would have returned a signal, and perhaps she was, but she didn't know what the meaning was associated with a mouth agape. She did manage to nod slowly. They said it together. Shem Zenus. The man nodded and smiled hesitantly. His wife spoke up. I didn't mislead you when I said that there was no Shem Zenus with us, Mr. Shin. He isn't with us right now. But he did tell us how to enter your home and where to find the knife some time ago. Perrin stared hard at the dark woman's husband. Where is he? I want to talk to him now. I don't know, the man confessed. He missed our meeting last night. The first time it's happened in a very long time. Thorn must have a very tight hold on him right now. How do you know about Thorn? Mari asked, slightly dazed, still trying to process what she was hearing. I know everything, Mrs. Shin. Whatever Shem knows, I know. He turned to Perrin. Everything. You can trust me. Perrin sat back and folded his arms, probably feeling just as exposed as Mari did right then. Mari shook her head. So when Shem went on leave, he didn't go to Flax? The man chuckled. The first time he ever went near Idemia 
was when he was chasing the colonel almost three years ago. You know about that? Murray asked in amazement. Oh, wait, you know everything. She put her hands to her head to rub her temples, as if that might put all that she heard in some kind of order. Perrin stared at the large man, trying to understand just what all of this meant. Shem Zenus was a garter, in a way. Both Perrin and Mari had suspected that once, a long time ago. But he wasn't really a garter, but a Salamite. Mari could see in Perrin's face exactly what she was thinking. Shem Zenus had lied to them for years. They called him brother. He watched their children. He helped when the family was ill or injured. He ate with them, laughed with them, cried with them. He slept in their home. He rescued them. He knew everything about them, more intimately than any other man. And they obviously knew nothing about him. Mari was wondering how to feel about him when she heard the woman speaking again. My husband doesn't know everything, she said worriedly. He doesn't know where Shem's been the past three weeks. The man shrugged. But he's back, I'm sure of it. He is, Perrin said, sounding surprised to be volunteering that information. He stood up next to the large man. Perrin probably could take him, Murray decided. Perrin was likely evaluating that scenario, too. Maybe if he surprised him, and the man was wounded, and blindfolded, and tied to a large rock. Look, Perrin said, you tell me I can trust you, but I have no reason to. Until I speak to Shem, I'm going to find it very difficult to trust anyone, especially Shem. But I can read his eyes, I think, he added quietly. The man put a sympathetic hand on Perrin's shoulder. I wish we had that kind of time, but Mr. Shin, we don't. Your family is in danger right now. We need to get you out and to safety. Out? Where? Murray asked. We'll take you to Salem tomorrow night. Mari was glad she was sitting down because her ability to hold herself up was gone. Perrin was already shaking his head. Tomorrow? No, absolutely not. I told your wife I would consider this. We need time to think, to weigh the decision. Now the man was shaking his head. You have no time for... How do you know? Perrin bellowed. What do you know? The man smiled patiently. You're a man of faith. I know you are. And as a man of faith, you know there are times you must trust in what you are told and believe that the verification will come later. I can't tell you how we know. To be honest, I don't know myself why you need to leave so quickly. But it has been made very clear to our leaders in Salem that you must leave tomorrow night. All of you. That's just not possible, Mari exclaimed. I mean, we do have enough silver and gold. You won't need any of that, the man told them. We have no use for it in Salem. Perrin scowled. How can that be? It can be quite well, the woman assured them. Oh, how I wish we had more time to explain things to you, but we simply don't. We realize that we're asking you to put a great deal of faith in us, but I promise you'll be glad you did. Mari sighed. But right now we can't go on a journey to exactly where is Salem? The man's smile turned apologetic. I'm afraid I can't tell you that either. Perrin exhaled in aggravation. No matter how far it is, Mari insisted, Jatesy can't make the journey. She's expecting and soon. Mrs. Shin, the woman said kindly, moving expecting women is what we do best. What do you mean? Perrin asked sharply. The woman remained calm despite the glare aimed at her. Mr. Shin, 
How many people go missing each year? We know you were trying to figure that out two years ago, before Moreland. Perrin took a surprised step backwards. Uh, we never got definitive numbers. The villages don't like to record those kinds of failures, but at most, maybe 100 a year. The man shook his head. It's closer to 300 each year, according to Shem's records, usually more. There are some who are lost to accidents, but far more are lost to Salem. Why? Mari asked, but she already had a feeling she knew. Many reasons, the man told her. Some are fleeing from some kind of oppression. He nodded to his wife. Tell them, I think it will help. The woman nodded back. Mrs. Shin, Mr. Shin, I'm sure you know because Mrs. Shin mentioned them on the platform to Mr. Corey. Mrs. Braxix was there and heard. She added an explanation. King Quirrell I had servants, right? Perrin slowly sat down. How do you know about... Those servants were held in the compound of the mansion during the Great War, the woman said. And after the war, they were told that the world outside was a dangerous, lawless place. Mari stared at the woman, fascinated. For three generations, the quarrels held those servants, trapped as slaves. Her voice grew husky, and she cleared her throat. Until one day, a general named Per Shin decided to undo that terrible wrong. High General Shin freed those 33 servants, sent them to winds, and made sure they had a new life of freedom. Yes, he did, Perrin whispered. The woman smiled as a tear trickled down her face. I am one of their great-granddaughters. Perrin covered his mouth with his hand. I tried looking once for your ancestors. His muffled voice trailed off. Mari felt a tear slide down her face, too. Thank you, the woman beamed. But my ancestors left only two years after they settled in winds. Salemites came for them and took them away for a real life of freedom. As they had children, they told them the story. And each one of us, as we grew old enough, vowed we would do what we could to finally free Per Shin's descendants. Perrin, Shin, I've been waiting many years to fulfill my family's vow to free you. He was speechless. So was Mari. The woman looked at her husband and smiled. Fortunately, I don't look anything like my great-great-great-grandfather Quirrell II, at least according to a couple of people who knew. It took Perrin another minute to finally stammer out, My, my grandfather, my, my grandfather thought the quarrels fathered some of their servants. The dark woman shrugged, but smiled. It's true, isn't it? Perrin whispered. Everything. How could you know? Unless you learned it from those who, who... The woman's husband put a comforting hand back on his shoulder. We don't make it a habit to drop so much information at once. We usually teach you over several weeks. I'm sorry for the onslaught, but as I said before, time is of the essence. We move people all the time. Some have been oppressed, like my wife's ancestors. Others are being threatened by the administrators, but many others are just looking for a better life or are in danger of being sent to Idamea. Sent to Idamea? Mari wondered. Then she remembered what the woman said about moving expecting women. Because they're expecting a third baby? Perrin's gaze shifted to the floor, and his fingers pinched the bridge of his nose. This was a new movement for him, and Mari didn't know what to make of it. Yes, the woman said. Mrs. Shin, it's not by accident that many of the midwives in the world are now from Salem. When a woman confides to her midwife that she desires more children, 
they're supposed to convince the woman to take the drink. Unless, she said with a sly smile, that midwife is from Salem. Then we present them with another solution. We've been doing it for decades, the husband told them. Shortly after a woman delivers her second child, but before she's to take the drink, the family is moved to another village with our assistance. Sometimes the grandparents move with them. No one in the new village knows them or knows if the wife took the drink. They live there for a season, keeping to themselves and not meeting anyone. Neighbors don't take an interest in each other here, so it's not a problem. Then we take the family to Salem. Since no one knew them, no one's too alarmed at their disappearance, and they're soon forgotten. One of the main routes to Salem is controlled by Shem. He's made our job much easier over the years. Perrin shook his head, still focused on the floor. Mari cringed. She could only imagine what he was thinking. Just yesterday, he told her he knew everything. Quite often, the mother is already expecting, the woman added. We've had several close to birthing, having been kept hidden by their husbands, until they finally confide in a Salemite midwife about their disloyalty to the administrators. Then we have to work very quickly. There have even been a few babies born along the way. We have a lot of movement to Salem once the weather warms. That's when mothers can no longer hide their bellies in snowing season clothing. I'm sorry. I forgot. You call it the raining season. That's marvelous, Mari sighed. So many women having more than two children. She beamed at her husband, and her smile faded. His head was still down, his fingers rubbing his forehead. Perrin, she said gently. She could barely hear his response. That's what he was trying to tell me after Peta was born about the drink and garter women. That's what Shem... He slumped in the chair, still not looking up. I didn't know. I didn't know. I couldn't imagine. How could I have possibly thought that we... He cleared his throat to reduce the emotion in it. Mari's heart ached for him. He must have been reliving the conversation on their second wedding anniversary, too. The night he told her adamantly there was no possible way they could have four or even three children. Duty to the administrators. Way it must be. Mari had been bitterly disappointed, but had gotten over it years ago, grateful for the two children they did have. The news that many in the world defied the administrators by not taking the drink had filled Mari with immense hope. But the news had the opposite effect on Perrin. There was no way they could have done it back then, Mari realized. Just vanish from the world? High General Ralph Shin would have never have rested until he found them. Everything happened as it should. She was sure of it. But Perrin's posture suggested a man devastated by regret. Your daughter can have a different future, Mr. Shin the woman said kindly. The man patted Perrin's shoulder. Perrin's head came up and he looked at Mari with bloodshot eyes. Both of our children could have a different future, he whispered. Mari nodded at him. Perrin cleared his throat gruffly and wiped his wet face. Um, perhaps you may know. About two years ago, as we were planning the offensive, the commander from Quake mentioned a family with two little boys. Yes, the man said. Shem told me about them. Fod's neighbors, they came to Salem, and four moons later they were joined by a sister. The family is expecting their fourth child now. Perrin's shoulders sagged in relief. Uh, another couple, much earlier. Last name of Jordan. The man smiled. Shem mentioned them, too. I had a feeling you'd be asking, so I looked them up in our records. Mr. Jordan was under pressure of King Quarrel IV. To make swords? Perrin asked. 
He was experimenting with metals. No, to make something else. Quarrel IV wasn't the brightest man. He was sure that the correct mixture of metals could create gold. Mr. Jordan had no success in convincing him gold wasn't an alloy. The king became desperate and, influenced by his very controlling mother, threatened to take Mr. Jordan's grandson as hostage until the grandfather found a way to create gold. Mr. Jordan confided in his rector, asking for ideas. The rector happened to be from Salem, one of the first we sent. The Jordans came to Salem to save their grandson's life. With them gone, there was no more threat to Gary. They lived in Salem for 24 years. Died just a few years ago. Perrin pinched his nose again. Carrie, Roar, and Jordan, they left for you. How ironic. King Oren was still in power when Jordan started command school. The very government that forced his grandparents to leave was the one he pledged to serve. All that to avenge his grandparents. And they were alive most of that time. He put his head in his hands. Is there any way I can tell Gary? Let him know they were all right. I'm sorry. No, the man said quietly. We have to maintain complete silence about disappearances. As much as we want people to know where we are, we can't risk Idemia finding out about Salem. The world would never let us live in peace. Once you leave the world, that's it. There can be no contact and no returning. You have to give up all that you know, but I promise you'll wish you could have done it sooner. The elder Jordans missed their family, but they had a full and rich life and knew that their grandson was safe. But you won't have to abandon your family. We want to bring all of you. The four of them sat in silence, the visitors in dark model clothing, letting Mari and Perrin mull over all they had been told. For the second time in less than a moon, all that Mari knew she knew was abruptly overturned. While the news three weeks ago was too infuriating to believe, the ideas of tonight were too fantastic to embrace. In her mind was a flood of information, which she tried to contain with a washcloth. One thing was for sure. As a history teacher, she'd been terribly inaccurate. Eventually, she whispered, I never wanted to leave this house. My father helped build it. My husband added to it. Our children were born here. Every good memory is in this house. The woman answered just as softly. And you take every good memory with you. Your life isn't the house. Your life is your family. Your parents are gone, but you carry them with you wherever you go. Things don't matter. People do. Ask yourselves honestly, Mr. and Mrs. Shin. What do you have to keep you here? Her husband said. Things? Familiarity? Now consider this. What do you have to gain by leaving? What kind of future could your children have? Mr. Shin, you seem to be interested in explorers. Come on the greatest exploration of all. Come find a new life. Mari smiled dimly. We were just planning to find Terrip's ruins. Mrs. Shin, he grinned. We can give you a fully guided tour of Terrip's ruins. We send tour groups there every year. Mari didn't know how much more she could take that night. Please consider what we've said, the woman said. I assure you that what we have in Salem is what you've always looked for. We know about your family and have for years. We have what you've been looking for. It's time to come home. Mari felt those last words more deeply than anything ever before. She was powerfully aware of the sudden presence of her father and her mother as well, sitting on either side of her. They filled her with the same message. It's time to go home. The emotion overwhelmed her. 
and to avoid anyone seeing her eyes brimming, she glanced blurrily around the walls of her home and the rocks she had loved so much. She focused on a favorite smooth, flat rock her father had placed and replaced. Tonight, it looked different. It was just a rock. She shifted her gaze to her husband. His head was down, his fingers interlaced. She wished he'd look up and show her what he was thinking. But then she knew. As intensely as she felt Cephas and Hysimum, she also felt Ralph and Joriana on either side of him. At last, he took a deep breath and released it, then raised his head and gave her a new expression. They were going to Salem. That's the end of that chapter. Thank you. I love this chapter so fun.